Heavenly Father, thank You for this good day. Dear Lord, thank You for the privilege that is ours to gather together as the people of God and to worship Your name and to open Your Word together. Dear Lord, we need the regular intake of Your Word. We need the, uh, the presence, uh, the fellowship of God's people. We need, Father, the, the ministry of Your Holy Spirit amongst us. And so, Father, we are incredibly grateful for this privilege. Father, we pray that You would keep everyone safe and healthy this morning. And Lord, we pray that You would bless in all that's done and said. Father, we pray that Your name would be glorified. Thank You. We love You in Jesus' name. Amen. So, most of us who are Christians probably have very little patience with the whole entitlement attitude of so many young people today in America. We see it. And um, I think that especially the older generation, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have the entitlement thing. When, when we were growing up, when we were kids, if there was something that needed to be done, we might have gotten a boot in the seat of the pants and, and, a, and a little encouragement to get out there and do it. Don't sit, sit around and whine that it isn't done. And uh, I remember as a five-year-old that uh, if, if, if it was summertime, which in Michigan, you, there was a lot of the year that you couldn't go outdoors and do much, but in the summertime, we'd be out having a, a family softball game or whatever, and I was the first one to get called in to set the table for supper, and it's like, no, I dreaded, you know, I have to leave the game to go wash your hands, Randall, and set the table and prepare for supper, and um, we just didn't have a lot of, oh, honey, I'm so sorry, and, and we didn't have a lot of that. We had t chores and assignments, and, and it wasn't bad. It was good. So I'm curious, why, what do you think? Why do you think that we have so many young people today with an entitlement attitude? Parents have babied them. So Ryan, is that microphone working? It's all... It, Barry, did you do that? Did you put that up there? Yes, that is so cool. I like how you mounted that. That is really, really neat. And it probably doesn't pick up very much, but it just picks up background noise at least. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think there's a... It's, it's strange to think about because... And really, what, is a, what does a child do that grows up in a, in a, in a residential area? What, what, you know, you can't exactly tell them to go out and, and milk the cow. Right? So we're living in a kind of a funny time when children, it's not entirely, we can't just blame them for what's going on, but this entitlement attitude, I think most of us would agree it's not such a good thing. And the truth of the matter is, is a little bit of hardship in our life is actually better. What happens to people who win the lottery? Is it good for most of them? The vast majority, look at that, pretty much everybody's in agreement, the vast majority end up worse off after than they were before they, they won the lottery, and yet people still go out and quote-unquote invest in the lottery, which is the worst possible investment. The worst thing that could happen is if you win. Um, and, and we all know about the butterfly. Cutting him out of the co cocoon does not help the butterfly. It, he needs to be able to work his way out and stretch and exercise. And so hardship is often just what we need to grow and develop in a physical sense, and apparently the same thing is true in a spiritual sense. Apparently the very same principles apply that we, we, it doesn't do us well to be just raised in constant comfort and ease even as Christians and in our Christian life. There's something healthy about facing some hardships in living in the Christian life, and yet we don't often think of it that way. And, and even in the history of God's people in the Old Testament, we see that even after God would bring a great deliverance, like taking them through the Red Sea and, and spoke to them and gave him his word, and then the very next thing that happens is they go out on their journey three days out and there's no water. And what are they going to do? Huh? They're going to complain, of course. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, then they went out to the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they found water. And they couldn't drink the waters of Marah because they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. 
And the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. <laughs> I mean, this is so hilarious. Well, of course, here, you see that tree? That one right there. Okay, that one. What do you want me to do with it? Cut it down, throw it in the water. You're <laughs> like, what? Does God, I mean, God can bring a solution out of no solution. And that's exactly what he did. He cast it in the waters and the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he, what? He tested them. So, so God specifically took them three days out. It was dry. There was no water. And then he brings them to a water hole that they can't drink out of because it's bad water. Isn't that interesting to think about? And, and God, it was not an accident. Nothing about what happened was an accident. It was all by God's design to see how they would respond to this situation. Will they respond to this impossible situation and turn their hearts to the same God who just brought them through the Red Sea, who just destroyed the entire Egyptian army, who should have won by a landslide, instead of turning and saying, Lord, we have a water need and um, we're, we're turning to you because we know that you're the God who can fix it. Instead of that, they're angry with Moses. And they're, they're ready to gripe and complain, but it was a test from the Lord. And so he says, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight, give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes, if you do that, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. What does that have to do with water? <laughs> God actually brought this water situation to highlight that He's able to take care of even their illnesses if they would... Just trust Him and seek Him. How interesting. For I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, and there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, so they camped there by the waters. So, so does God test us because He hates us? Obviously not. Does He test us because He doesn't know what's going on in our lives, and so it's just kind of like an accident, that this accident happened and, and things got really hard for me, and it's like... Well, God must not be paying attention to my situation. No, it's not that either. God knows exactly what comes into our life. In fact, if, if He doesn't outright permit something to happen, He may actually be the author of it. Of not easy, but hard. Yes, in the life of, of His own children, in the life of, of Christians. Now, um, I, I don't know if you have ever been at a point as a Christian where you came to the point where you say, God, why are, why did you just let this happen to me? Probably none of us have ever been there. Probably none of us have ever been to the point of questioning uh, the hardship that we face or the difficulty. Um, I mean, and, and, and hardships that we do to ourselves, okay, we can put up with that. But when we're doing something to serve the Lord and a hardship comes, it's like, God, where are you? What are you thinking? Why, why would you allow this to happen to me? And I know that none of you have ever felt that or thought that. The truth of the matter is, we're all made differently. We have different temperaments and different personality characteristics, and we have different circumstances that come into our lives, and we have different talents and different abilities and different way we respond to things. But one thing is probably true for all of us. We're all bound to suffer some hardships along the path of our lives, aren't we? They're not all the same. One person's given this situation, another person's given that situation. But those circumstances are intended to drive us to, to God, not away from Him, if we will have the humility to turn to Him and seek Him. So, again, I, I, I can't help but smile when I think about the hardships to come that come to someone that's faithfully serving the Lord. Here's, some, here's, a, here's a person faithfully serving the Lord and he gets thrown in prison because he's preaching the gospel. You say, well, well come on, God, where, where are you? Well, instead of saying that, maybe we need to say, hey, maybe God has a reason for this. There may be a reason that I can't see. Maybe God wants to use me to witness to these, these people in prison. Or, or who knows? We don't have all the answers. And by the way, if there is ever a time when you get a little depressed, which none of you ever do, if you ever get discouraged and you get depressed and you feel like giving up, just read Jeremiah. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, this poor guy. What he 
went through in serving the Lord. And by the way, in this chapter 20 that we'll look at today, Jeremiah is going to have one of his woe is me moments where he's saying it would have been better off if I had never been born. Oh, no, oh yeah, that's Jeremiah chapter 20. And so our theme for today, it isn't always easy to serve the Lord. I mean, just because we put our trust in Christ, it doesn't mean that He gave us a... a, 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 a go directly to, you know, get out of jail free card. We don't get that just for being a Christian. In fact, sometimes when we put our faith in the Lord, it actually may complicate our lives, right? But, but that's not because God hates us. It's actually because He loves us. He has a purpose and He uses even hardships to draw us to Him. What athlete that is naturally gifted can just lay in bed all day and still be a super athlete? None. It, it takes tremendous self-discipline. They may have natural abilities, but the natural abilities without some hardships and hard work is never going to get them anywhere. And so here in Jeremiah chapter 20, we're going to see five hurdles that uh, often uh, happen to those who are serving the Lord. And, and therefore our theme, it isn't always easy to serve the Lord. Five hurdles. The first is official intimidation because that's what happened in Jeremiah's life. Jeremiah chapter 20, 1 and 2, he says, Now Pasher, or not he says, but it's recorded for us. Now Pasher, the son of Immer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. What did he prophesy? What we just read in chapter 19 last week. Remember Jeremiah prophesied, and, and first he, prophesied, he went out with the leaders out to the gate at, at the sons of Hinnom the valley of the son of Hinnom, and, and prophesied there. And then he comes back into the temple court, which, by the way, was the jurisdiction of Pasher. He was the sheriff. They had 12 uh, sheriffs, so they each, each month was designated to a different one. He was an officially designated uh, son of the priest. So he was official, but he was like the sheriff. He was like the security uh, detail leader of the, the temple. And here comes Jeremiah into, the temp, into his precinct, and stands up and proclaims this message. And so Pasher has the authority, legally granted. And what does he do? Pasher struck Jeremiah the prophet and put him in stocks that were there in the high, that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. So here's Pasher. So Jeremiah comes and he has a message. And the message is not a real happy one. The message that God gave him to speak is that the enemy is going to defeat them. When you think about it, from a human standpoint, Jeremiah's message was almost treasonous. You realize that? What he was saying was essentially, there's no point in standing up against the, the, the armies that are coming in because God is the one who has put them in place. God is the one who's bringing them against us. So from a... a, a, a a cultural and a national perspective, Jeremiah's message was almost treasonous, but it was the message God gave him to speak. And, and remember, he went out, God says, go out and I'll tell you what you're going to speak when you get there. He didn't even give him the heads up ahead of time what the message was going to be. And so there he goes to speak, and the response is official intimidation. And is it any wonder? People hated him, and it's not a surprise because he has a message of warning, and it fell on unappreciative ears. It wasn't even exactly new. What had Isaiah prophesied? It's essentially the same thing. Isaiah, 100 years before, had prophesied it's going to be really rough. And what was the response? How did they treat Isaiah? They killed him. <laughs> so, so here's Jeremiah now, and he's in the same situation. So if the guy that that represented the same point of view that you had and was faithful to the Lord, was executed, and now you're in this role of bringing basically the same message of destruction, uh, you could see how he would be intimidated. And many times, Satan's one of Satan's most effective tools isn't to even destroy us, it's just to intimidate us. Many times, it's just a boo! And what do we do? We melt. And isn't that part of what's happening right now? All over America, there are churches that are in limbo saying, what do we do? And if we do this, what, what they, could, they could shut us down. They could. They, they, they really could. So 
all they have to do is threaten, and in many cases, we end up conceding. We're intimidated by the threat and back away. So they tried uh, intimidation here on, on Jeremiah. So Jeremiah faces this first hurdle of official intimidation. If you bring this message, you're against the nation. You're against uh, God's people, they would say. And in ter- indeed, the intimidation went further. It became actual persecution. So in the New American Standard Bible, it says, When Pasher, the priest, the son of Immer, who was chief officer in the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, Pasher had Jeremiah the prophet beaten. That's probably closer to what it really means. He, he didn't just strike him. It wasn't just a slap on the side of the face. Apparently, Jeremiah was beaten. And at that point, you're saying, well, uh, couldn't God have prevented that? Uh, yes, he could have. So why didn't he? Well, we may never know the exact answer to that question, um, but uh, maybe part of the answer is is then when he released him on the following day, uh, Jeremiah was emboldened to actually speak what Pasher didn't want to hear. And Pasher led him, which is kind of surprising all by itself. So God could have prevented it, but he didn't. And does God promise to spare us from intimidation or persecution? No. Second Timothy 3.10 says, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. Now I want you to think about, I'm going to read about a string of about three or four passages of Scripture. And I want you to think about how these descriptions of persecution in the early church, how this relates to America and Christianity in America today. Okay? So Paul says, he went through persecutions, afflictions, which happened to him at Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, by the way, stoned and left for dead. That's, it, it was very physical, brutal, out of which uh, the Lord delivered him from all of them, yes, and all, who des- and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Psalm 50, verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you shall glorify me, but it doesn't say that I'm going to keep you from going through hardships, it doesn't say that. He says, call on me when you go through the hard times. And, and he will deliver according to his plan. Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted. <laughs> Do you feel blessed when, well, first of all, most of us have never been through real persecution. Maybe none of us, I don't know. Persecution, there, there are Christians in the world today who are going through real persecution, physically abused and, and even executed, Right? He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. That's what Jesus said. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Are you kidding me? When persecution happens against us, do we say, yay! Do we rejoice? and That's what he says. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Yeah, we're seeing that right now. Okay. Then he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So as you respond to persecution without reviling, without getting angry, First Peter, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. However, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been what? Whoops. You've been grieved by various trials. Huh. That the genuineness of your faith... Oh, what did I do here? You've been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, 
though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He's saying here that it's actually, we may go through various trials right now. Why? So that the genuineness of our faith may be tested, may be proved. So that as we go through a hard situation, just because we're a child of God, instead of lashing out in anger or asking God, how come you're allowing this to happen? Instead, we turn to Him and say, wow, God has a purpose and He's actually testing my, and testing in the sense of testing gold to purify it and refine it. Not, not to try and shoot us down, that's not the purpose at all. But in fact, that we would be tested, that we would come out on top. So I just asked the simple question. Here's Paul talking about enduring testing. Here's Jesus saying, blessed are you. How does that match up with Christianity in America today? I mean, it's, huh? Not very well. Uh, we in, in America, what have we done to Christianity? What have we taught our children with regard to Christianity? Have we, have we taught this kind of a worldview that, that persecution is to be expected and that if hardships come, it's okay, it's, the Lord has a purpose? Is that what we've taught? I don't think it is. In fact, Joan and I have been laughing lately, thinking about, and, and we've done it all of our life, so one of the kids goes out the door, or one of us, now they're all long gone, one of us goes out the door, you're going out the door to go do something and have fun. That's kind of become the, the MO, have fun or have a good time, right? Was there anything wrong with that? Well, maybe not anything wrong with it, but what are we, we have come to assume that, the, that our driving purpose in life is to have a good time. As Christians, it's been easy in America to have a good time. And yet what we find in Scripture is that those who serve the Lord don't always have a good time. In fact, not having a good time is probably healthier for us spiritually than having a good time. Interesting to think about, isn't it? All right. Brother Jim, did I talk long enough for you to forget what you were going to say? No. Not quite. That's good. You're good. I would have forgotten it long ago. I was thinking that in case anybody was really listening to Jeremiah, seeing him suffer for what he was saying should help them to maybe give some credence to what he is saying, that he is actually giving God's message to them, that they maybe ought to pay a heed to it. Okay, that's an interesting idea. I think, too, of the ease that we have right? is really... A hardship in Counter, some ways. Counterproductive, isn't it? It's so here's the question. In some ways. Here's the question. The people did see Jeremiah suffered. Did it cost them to listen to his message? Well, the Lord <laughs> told him they weren't going to hear Sadly, him, so. it didn't, did it? Isn't that interesting to think about? All right. So five hurdles that serving the Lord may involve in our lives. First is official intimidation. We may get officially intimidated. We may have... Uh, even persecution. But secondly, an unpopular message. An unpopular message. Who'd be willing to read this for me? Lisa or Lynn? Or, okay. Here we go. And it happened on the next day that Pasher brought Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then Jeremiah said to him, The Lord has called your name Pasher, but Magor Misaba, for those says the, for thus says the Lord, Behold, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and your eyes shall see it. I will give all Judah into the land of the king of into Babylon, the hand. Oh, into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive to Babylon and slay them while the sword, with the, with sword. the sword. Moreover, I will deliver all the wealth of this city, all its produce, and all its precious things. All the treasures of the kings of Judah I will give into the hand of thy enemies, who will plunder them, seize them, and carry them to Babylon. And you, Pasher, and all who dwell in your house shall go into captivity. You shall go to Babylon, 
and there you shall die and be buried there, and you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied lies. Okay, what a happy message. <laughs> what a happy message. Pasher, you're the, you're the guy in charge right now. You're, you're, uh, you're over the temple security guard. You're in a position of authority, duly, posi- duly appointed position. You are a son of the priest. You are legitimately in the office that you're supposed to be in. Um, however, because of your rejection of what God's message is, of what he's about to do, you're going to watch your friends who are looking to you for leadership, you're going to watch them executed before your eyes. And we know in the case of the last king of Jerusalem that he would watch his own children executed before his eyes and then they would poke his eyes out for the last thing that he would see on earth was watching his own children executed. Now, is that what you would call a popular message? Is this the kind of message that you would expect to hear in a megachurch today? No. Why not? (laughs) Okay. You have to get right to it there, huh, Jim? doesn't promote church growth. This is the kind of message you wouldn't even want to tell to your worst enemy. I mean, even somebody that you don't like, you would tremble to share this message because it's so gloom and doom, sad, and uh, I mean, even, even if there was an elected official who treated you so terribly that they specifically picked on you and made your life difficult, you still wouldn't, you, any sympathy in our heart would cause us to not want to have to share that, this message with even our worst enemy. Well, what about the people that we know and love? Would, would we... Would we want to bring an unpopular message to the people that we care deeply about? It's kind of um, interesting to think about because really when we think about the judgment that's coming for those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ, we realize that the punishment is forever under God's wrath in a literal place called hell, which is probably not mentioned also in churches that do a popular message that, that are busy sharing. and I mean, there, there's lots of happy things that you can get out of Scripture. But if you just tell people happy, happy, and everything's happy, and they die without putting their faith in Christ, that wasn't a happy message at all, was it? It was a lie. It was deception. So here comes Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is giving a message that nobody wanted to hear, and I'm sure that Jeremiah was not even especially fond of giving. But it was the message God put in his heart. Pasher certainly didn't want to hear Jeremiah's message, and yet he heard it. That's what's amazing to me. And and God spoke through Jeremiah. Now, you you know, it's an interesting thing. As Christians, um, we know there's a difference between being absolutely white hot in our Christian walk of really living for the Lord Jesus Christ and just treading water, right? I'll be honest with you, I have 65 years as a Christian. I mean, 60 years as as a Christian, rather. 60 years that I've known the Lord. And, well, I, I I would really like to say that I spent 60 years just really living for the Lord. I can't say that. Even times when, when, when I was on a foreign mission field serving the Lord, quote unquote, that doesn't mean that my heart was really in, in close fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ and filled with the Spirit. We just assume that. We assume that if a person comes to, to, to church and they're a missionary and they're supported, they're, they, they, they're through a mission board and, and they're officially designated and they know all the theological answers and they did a doctrinal statement and it's just like ours and they're good people. We just assume that they're walking with the Lord. That's not a given. It's not automatic. But imagine if as a child of God and even serving in an official capacity as a pastor or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher, it doesn't automatically mean that we're walking with the Lord. What if we're in a place where God has appointed us to be, but we're not in fellowship with Him, we're not in submission to the Spirit of God, and the opportunity comes to speak God's message, but it's an unpopular message, so we're not ready to share it. I wonder how many times we have 
miss the opportunity to speak an unpopular message because we were not spiritually prepared to do so. And sometimes it's exactly that unpopular message that God will use to open someone's heart. It isn't always popular, is it? No. What about Peter on the day of Pentecost? Was that a happy, happy, positive message for the people on the day of Pentecost? What did, what did Jesus say to them? Therefore, or what did Peter say to them? Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Was that a happy message? No. It wasn't a, a positive feeling, feel good about yourself kind of a message at all. It was an accusatory message, wasn't it? He was accusing them of rejecting and crucifying their Messiah. That didn't make them feel very happy. What about Stephen? What about Stephen when he's preaching to all the, the religious leaders there and, and they've taken him in because he's preaching about Christ? What did, he, what did Stephen say to them? He says he tells them the whole history of Israel and then he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. I don't know if there was a change of tone <laughs> when he got this passage. I don't know if he still maintained a, a, a gentle, loving, uh, you know, our father Abraham and, and so forth. He got to this point and, and possibly said, you stiff Stiff-necked and uncircumcised. I don't know which tone of voice he used, but he said it because it's written for us. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. See, I, I can't even read the words without getting... Argh! As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. Try and say that with a smile on your face who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they said, oh, what a happy message. Oh boy, that just makes us feel so good. No, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And you're going to say to me, yeah, pastor, but, but when he preached that message... Um, it was an unpopular message, but look what happened. They killed him. That didn't do any good. We're going to find in the morning message from Acts chapter 11 that it did a whole bunch of good. Because the death of Stephen, the, 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 the martyr for Jesus Christ, lit a fire under people to go out in every direction telling others about Jesus Christ. We look at it and say, what a loss. He was a dynamic uh, servant of the Lord and, and he spoke this unpopular message and it just made people mad and they, so mad they killed him. So what a, what a waste. Well, yes, he gave his life. But the result in the spread of the gospel was powerful. It wasn't a waste at all. Unpopular message. And... Uh, there are, I mean, happy messages are wonderful. Who wouldn't like to, what preacher wouldn't like to have a popular, happy, happy, make you feel good message? Are you kidding? There are, there are preachers in America today who've made themselves multimillionaires by just doing the happy passages, right? The Pollyanna passages of Scripture. It's, uh, but, 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 uh, that's not what Scripture indicates that God wants us to just do happy, happy. If, if we just tell people happy, happy, everything's going to be okay, and they end up destroyed forever, then that was the wrong message. Yes, Teddy? We're a generation that, that doesn't want correction. We, we spawn it, and we need to not be silly all the time. Right. We, we, we think of... Things, we talk about things that don't matter. Yeah. yeah. And, and it does matter because right. it affects our life. But so, don't you think that we... They hate correction. And, and, and that point right there is so interesting because in America, even in Christianity in American Christian homes, we have often used the same approach in raising our children to where instead of correcting misbehavior, we, we bribe them. Oh, oh honey... Here, 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 have a, have a cookie. Really? Is that the right way to correct misbehavior? Have a cookie? Or, or oh, here, watch this TV program. I'll, I'll, I'm going to bribe you into uh, doing something. That, 
No, sometimes we need to teach our children that particular behavior is unacceptable. Do it again and you will be corrected and it will, it will be unpleasant for you. And, and when we actually bring the unpopular message, we're not doing something that's a disfavor, we're actually bringing a tremendous benefit. And so God is, is a God who in many cases expects for His servants to bring an unpopular message. Do, do, when you talk to your unsaved loved ones, is it easy and fun to say to them, you know, God has sent His Son, Jesus, to pay the penalty for our sins, and, and what we all deserve for our sins is eternal judgment. But God has paid the penalty, and if we will put our trust in Him, is that an easy message to share necessarily? No. Is it a popular message? No. But is it a necessary message? Yes. And so it's so critically important. Isn't, it isn't always easy to serve the Lord, is it? And these are hurdles that... I believe if we're serving the Lord, we're going to face. Official intimidation, unpopular message. Thirdly, a heavy responsibility. Okay, someone please read for me here. Uh, who's got a mic? Maybe Lisa, Lisa will be willing to do that. Oh, Lord, you induced me, and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. For when I spoke, I cried out. I shouted, violence and plunder because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. This is uh, pretty interesting when you think about it. Um, and I, and I can't help but believe this is precisely why there's a thing called a call to ministry. And not, we may, we, every child of God, we have a ministry to fulfill, but we're not all called to the ministry. We, and it's important for us to understand that distinction. And we praise God and thank God for men of God who are called specifically to the ministry. But think of the weight of responsibility that falls upon them. Here's Jeremiah. He says, you induced me. You persuaded me. You're stronger than I am and have prevailed. I'm in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. And, and so it, it's as if he's saying, everyone mocks me. And so his only alternative was to shout and say, no, violence and plunder is coming. And they're mocking and laughing at him. And, and then he realized, okay, that's not doing good. I'll just be quiet and won't say anything. But that didn't work either. It was like a fire burning in his heart saying, I must speak. These people are, 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 are going right over a cliff. They're going to their own destruction. Somebody's got to tell them. Somebody's got to warn them. So he couldn't even hold it back. He, 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 in one hand, they wouldn't listen, and they're mocking him. And so he shouts, that doesn't do any good. You know, I, I still remember, I've told you some of you before this, that when I was in the Civil Air Patrol, clear back in the distant past, in the 60s, I went to a summer encampment, and we were being taught uh, everything we needed to get the private pilot's license uh, written test done. A lot of information, a short amount of time, and we had military instructors who had been fighter pilots in Vietnam, and they were donating their time and teaching young people. And I still remember one of the guys who would occasionally jump up and down with both feet because he felt like we were falling asleep or not paying attention. This is important. He'd be jumping up and down, making a you know, and, and to get people's attention. I always thought that was so funny. But I think sometimes God's servants are in that situation. What do I do? I mean, I, we've got the answers. How do we how do we convince people to listen? Here's Jeremiah. What a burden of heavy responsibility was placed on him. So we get to Jeremiah 23. So so. This, this thing of ministry, of, of being involved in serving the Lord, this isn't something we just conjure up. This isn't something we just say, oh, I think I'm going to be a pastor. I think I'm going to be a missionary. Sadly, there were those who did that. And that's what God addresses with Jeremiah in chapter 23. He says, I've not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I've not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. So there's no shortage of people who will stand up and say, oh, I'm a prophet of the Lord. God says, well, you may be, but you're not one of mine. If they had stood in my counsel and caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned from their evil, uh, turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. In other words, if these people really were my servant, 
They would be in my presence enough that when they bring the message, it would cause God's people to change course. To, to not just simply keep on going right over, the, right over the cliff into sin. Tell me, what is the advantage of a happy, happy message going to church every Sunday if families all through the church are ending in divorce? Do you not see that something is really wrong and yet we just, okay, push them aside, get the next one. Entertain people, make them feel good. Or actually we have churches where exes are in the same church and, and uh, competing with over grandkids or over children. And oh my goodness, what a sad situation has come in the church. And why is it happening? In part it's happening because the servants of the Lord are just delivering a happy, happy, feel-good message instead of saying, no, God expects obedience of us. He loves us and He cares about us and He wants us to do what's right. Oh. Wow. You know, when I, when I think about what Jeremiah was going through and the heartache he was going through as he thought about his chosen people, Israel, and he saw what was going on and he's preaching his heart out and it's not doing any good. I'm, I'm thinking about the. Have you have you thought about the burden of responsibility that's on every one of God's servants right now, those in positions of leadership in churches? When I think about a man like John MacArthur, he's at the age he should be retiring and enjoying. You know, uh, should <laughs> there? See, I've allowed I've allowed my generation, my culture to infect me too. Um, but we would say, well, he should be able to enjoy the fruits of his hard labor. What an amazing ministry he's had over so many years. And what is he having to deal with right now? And same thing with the pastor in Santa Clara of, a big, of North Valley Baptist Church. Spent 37 years building an incredible ministry and tr a tremendously faithful man of God. And here he's at the point now of today facing the potential of going to prison or going to jail, having sh sheriffs come in. He says... What are we doing? He says, you know, we've had an excellent relationship with our county sheriff and our county board and our, and our community for 37 years. And now we're going to be arrested because we're holding a worship service? Wow. The burden of responsibility. And then you have other pastors today in churches. And, and listen, don't get me wrong. I'm not down on any pastor that's struggling with this, with this question. There are other pastors that today are meeting with their congregation outdoors because they've been told they can't meet indoors. And there are others that haven't even met at all for months. Their churches are not even meeting out of fear. They, and, 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 and again, I'm not here to condemn them. They're, I believe many of them have the best of intentions. They want to do what's right. But the pressure of responsibility of a pastor like John MacArthur saying, well, wait a minute. So our governor says this, but what did Jesus Christ say to us? I have an obligation to, to do what God has asked me to do. And yes, but you may be arrested. I don't care. It, it, it's a heavy responsibility that's thrown on those who are serving the Lord in full-time places of ministry. Listen, um, we ought to realize that, that in Pastor, was a, he was a, a, a licensed, authorized leader. But he was leading the people astray. And what it teaches us is how easy it is for even God's people to be led astray. I want to just say a little bit more on this heavy responsibility. So, so let me ask you something. Do you expect that a single president can be elected, whether it's the current one or someone else, can it be elected and go in and, and fix Washington, D.C.? Well, that was pretty quick. I don't either. But, so what does he need? He, I mean, just from a human standpoint, he needs to have some support of other like-minded people who are ready to, to, even if need be, go on the knife to, to stand up for what's right. Right? So, so cleaning up a mess like what's in Washington, D.C., the corruption that's clearly there because it keeps rearing its head and its head seems to get bigger and uglier every day, it requires a, a group effort. One man can't do it. What about when it comes to a, a church like Grace Community Church or North Valley Baptist Church in Santa Clara or Sierra Baptist Church? Can one man pull it and do it? Obviously not. It takes God's people together. Jeremiah 
was kind of on his own, wasn't he? Actually, he wasn't. We'll find out in a moment that he had some help. But, but um, it's a heavy responsibility. And we, we as God's people ought to be crying out to God to raise up the future leaders who will shoulder this burden because quite frankly, it's getting harder and harder. And it's partly because of what we said at the beginning about the entitlement mentality. Because even in our churches, even in Christian homes, sadly, without realizing an entitlement mentality has become the modus operandi for all of us. And we don't even realize it. So our children are often, it's like what they're saying about these, um, these Antifa people and, uh, and the, the rioters that are truly Marxists. And what's interesting about them is they say that the first time they're confronted with real authority, they melt and wither and go into a fetal position and cry. Not like Che Guevara and those communists in the past who were ready to die for their cause. Not this group. <laughs> that's the one, that's the one uh, funny part about this whole thing is that, that uh, this group now, they're cowards. Because we've raised them as cowards. But sadly, the same thing is true for... Christians, and that's why it's so hard to find Christian young people ready to sacrifice the comforts of America in order to go serve the Lord anywhere. Interesting to think about. It isn't always easy to serve the Lord. Five hurdles. Official intimidation, unpop unpopular message, heavy responsibility, and popular opposition. Who would be willing to read it here for me? Betty, you want to do it? You're just getting us ready to usher in the new world order. Okay, I'm not gonna, we're not going to do the whole <laughs> politics thing right now, but you're right. I agree with you. It, it's not a good time, is it, in our country? Who would be willing to read? Lisa, you ready to go? Okay. Or Julie? Lisa, go ahead. Go for, it. for I heard many mocking. Fear on every side. Hold it just a second. Just keep that, keep that little thing on right there in mind. Fear on every side. They're mocking, They're mocking. Jeremiah, okay. using this phrase at him. Okay, go ahead. Fear on every side. Yeah. Report, they say, and we will report it. All my acquaintances watched for my stumbling, saying, perhaps he can be induced, then we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, awesome one. Sorry, I hit the button. My bad. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. But, O oh Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous and see the mind and heart, let me see your vengeance on them, for I have pleaded my cause before you. Okay, so I've called this popular opposition. Way back at the, the first verse of this, uh, verse 10, I heard many mocking, fear on every side, report. Well, what is this whole fear on every side thing? Well, it turns out, that when, back in verse 3, when, when Jeremiah was let out of the stocks and he's given a chance to speak, he stands up and he says, the Lord has not called your name Pasher, the Lord has called your name fear on every side. That's what Magor Misabib means. So Jeremiah, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, stands up and says, your name has just gotten changed by Almighty God. No longer is your name Pasher. Now your me name means fear on every side. So from then on, all the people go around saying, hey, fear on every side. <laughs> hey, fear on every side. To mock him. This is called popular, uh, popular opposition. Even the people who should have welcomed his name and supported him were actually hoping for his demise. We're, we're not given evidence of anyone supporting him. Except one. Jeremiah says, but the Lord is with me as a mighty awesome one. Therefore my persecutors will stumble. They will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. So, uh, oh, Jeremiah, here he's facing this popular uh, opposition. And, and, you know, sometimes there are people that are just wackos that... That, that, that deal with popular opposition. Sometimes there are people who claim to be, I mean, there was this uh, camping, you know, that, that uh, prophesied the end of the world, and, and so there was this tremendous back and forth opposition, and there was a lot of popular opposition, and um, in the end, of course, he was wrong. But, but in spite of the fact that there are some people, because of their weirdness, will be opposed, the truth is the matter that those of us who serve Jesus Christ can expect there will be popular 
opposition to the message that we bear. We can just count on the fact. But I can't help but wonder if, if amongst those who were opposing Jeremiah, if there weren't at least some who deep in their heart knew that, you know, maybe, maybe we ought to listen. And, and, I, and I also can't help but wonder if in churches today there are some amongst the churches who are kind of going along in the same way that people went along with the mockers, who are just kind of going along to get along, who really don't have any actual faith in the Lord, and they're just kind of going along with the flow. And at some point, they may end up on the enemy side and not on our side. I remember a, a friend up in Oregon who is, uh, was uh, at, in Vietnam at the time of the Tet Offensive and he was there uh, on this base, large U.S. base, and he was being shaved because they had a, a, a barber and, and so forth there that was a Vietnamese guy. And when the, when the offensive came in, the guy that had used the straight edge to shave his throat was one of the enemies. Because they, they couldn't tell who the enemies were. And, and uh, they had insiders working within. And uh, so there are those imposters, and you can't help but wonder, wow, what's going on? Um, how many imposters will be among the faithful in the end? You know, it's easy to be a Christian when there's no hardship. Right? It's easy. It's easy when there's no hardship. But what will, what will our faith look like when they really start enforcing the no church rule. Still could happen. It could, we could still be literally, physically barred from meeting, couldn't we? And uh, what will that do to, to, to Christians? I, I believe that it's kind of a test and a, an opportunity to, to see the reality of some things. It isn't always easy to serve the Lord, is it? Five hurdles that we see here in Jeremiah's life. Official intimidation, unpopular message, heavy responsibility, popular opposition, and finally, depression. Now listen, there are some temperaments that just almost never get depressed. My wife is smiling because, I mean, it's a rare day when this old man gets depressed. She can tell in a heartbeat. But it's so rare, it's like maybe one day or two days out of a year. It's just depression is not my thing. I just, this, God didn't make me that way. But here's Jeremiah, man, he gets depressed. And sometimes it can be depressing serving the Lord. All right, someone please read for me here. Julie. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord, for He has delivered the life of the poor from the hand of evildoers. Cursed be the day in which I was born. Let the day not be blessed in which my mother bore me. Let the man be cursed who brought news to my father, saying, A male child has been born to you, making him very glad. And let that man be like the cities which the Lord overthrew and did not relent. Let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noon, because he did not kill me from the womb that my mother might have been grave, and her womb always enlarged with me. Why did I come forth from the womb to see labor and sorrow, that my days should be consumed with shame? Happy birthday to you. Happy nothing. Happy nothing. Pain, despair, and agony on me. So Jeremiah had some highs and lows, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he had some highs and lows, man. He was harassed, he was imprisoned, he was ridiculed, he was thrown in a pit, and then he was released. And he says, oh, praise the Lord, man. I just got released. But then he goes into the pain and despair. So now I opened up these verses and put a little break in between. Because commentators, Bible commentators, guys that know a lot more about this stuff than you and I, than you and me. No, than you. They know more about this than you and me. That's right. Um, the, the people who know a lot more about this than I do, <laughs> uh, they don't know what to do with this. Here's Jeremiah on one hand. He says, sing to the Lord, praise the Lord. And then he goes, cursed be the day in which I was born. The very next verse. How do, what do you do with that? I mean, it... How do you deal with that? And so they don't know. They struggle. They try and figure out. And there's lots of opinions, and they're all over the chart as to what really was going on here. And I don't know. But I, I can't. I wonder if the first, the, the part where he says, sing to the Lord, maybe is a response to the fact that he was let out of the stocks. Okay? I mean, it, that's got to be a pretty good thing. You're in stocks all night, out in the cold, and you've been beaten, you know, and you're in pain, and... and and then the next day you get let out and you get a chance to actually deliver God's message. That's pretty good. 
That's, that's probably, probably a good day for Jeremiah. And then he goes right to, cursed be the day in which I was born. Um, I can't help but wonder if he rejoiced when he had the opportunity to be released and to, to preach the truth, and then it hit him like a ton of bricks. Wait a minute. No matter what I tell these people, they're going to reject and they're going to, they're going to continue to rebel. There's nothing I can say that's going to turn these people to God. I can tell them what's coming. I can tell them the judgment of God is coming and they laugh at me. They call me, hey, terror on every side. <laughs> they're mocking. It doesn't matter what I do. And uh, it's got to be a little depressing for the man of God to realize that no matter how hard he preaches and proclaims the message of God, they're not listening. They don't care. They laugh at him and they would rather go right to their eternal damnation. <laughs> wow. And by the way, you can do a, a poll, a survey amongst pastors on Monday morning. There are more pastors that resign from the ministry on Monday morning than any other day of the week. Why? Because they were in church on Sunday preaching their heart out, they thought, and they come away with a feeling, nobody's listening, it doesn't matter who, you know, is this doing any good? And so they go through human depression. See, you thought that pastors never have human depression. The truth of the matter is, there's a great deal of it. In fact, pastors are dropping out of the ministry at record numbers right now. Human depression is a very real issue. And you say, well, so, and by the way, it isn't just pastors. Christians right now can look around. I mean, you, you, you wake up in the morning and it's a, it's a smoky day. I said to my son Joel yesterday on the phone, he lives in southern Oregon or in, in yeah, around Roseburg area. And yeah, I said, we've been dealing with this smoke for a week. I says, well, we've been dealing with it for three weeks. We haven't seen a clear sky or smelled clean air for three weeks, more or less. Right? And uh, that can be a little discouraging, can it? Or if you're a school teacher, and you find out that you can't meet with your children, you can't actually see them face to face, you've got to try and do it on the internet. Try and do it on, and, and, and a teacher's there trying to teach, and all of a sudden you notice that one of the kids is playing with his dog, or one of them's going and, and taking care of his little baby sister, and, and you're sitting there wondering, well, what, what am we doing? And it can be depressing, and it can be discouraging. So, so what recourse do we have? It turns out we have a recourse that Jeremiah had in a way, but not in the way that we do. And that recourse is we have the Spirit of the living God within us. We have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within us. Does that mean everything's happy, happy, easy? No! But it does mean that we have a means for dealing with the hardships that come into our lives. Read these, read these first two sentences with me. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. That's it. Let's read that one more time. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. It says, rejoice in the Lord when the sky is blue and the air is clean and you can breathe easy. And when everything's going great, when your bills are paid and, and you're comfortable and happy. No, it says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your kindness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Imagine that. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses, it goes way beyond all understanding, the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Imagine that. Imagine, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, thank you, Lord, for coronavirus. Thank you, Lord, for riots. What? Let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, even if they're uncomfortable messages for me that I have to change, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So I'll tell you one thing. 
uh, I rejoice for men of God in positions of authority like John MacArthur, like Franklin Graham, like Jack Hibbs, like uh, Jonathan Kahn. Some of these men who are in a much more visible place than we are, who are standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ without fear. I say without fear. You know, they, they probably have some semi-sleepful nights. They probably have some nights that they don't sleep so well. Because they are carrying a burden of responsibility of standing for the truth with a message that isn't always popular, and when there's some official intimidation, and when there's a heavy responsibility and popular opposition, and even maybe a little depression creeps in from time to time, when the camera rolls, they still have to stand up and be bold for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God for these men, and I think we ought to. And I, I believe that we ought to continue to uphold these men who are in very public places and pray for them and, and, and pray that they be encouraged and strengthened. For that matter, we probably ought to do it for our elected officials, maybe even for our president. Yes, Jim. These officials that are over us, for the most part, they don't have God in their worldview. Sure. Many of them are pawns of Satan and don't know it. Sure. We are supposed to be praying for them. Yes. We should do that. Yes. yes One we thing should. we can do, even for those that we figure wouldn't listen at all, God could put a little of His fear in their hearts so they'll be careful of how, how they treat the church. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a responsibility. Yes, we do. It isn't always easy to serve the Lord, is it? Sometimes it involves some uh, effort and intentionality on our part to, to serve Him, even when it's not easy. Okay? Okay, be back in 10 minutes. Bell's on your toes.